so much to cover and there's not that much time. Um, I'm Walter Land, I'm with the Biomedical Land Trust, we're a nonprofit organization that was started in 1994 to try to protect the greater Biomedical ecosystem, which includes not just the ecological reserve, but some adjacent lands as well. Um, to try to protect it as much as possible from, from ongoing urban encroachment. We're also very uh, interested in education, outreach, uh, you know, we do sometimes do litigation, I'll talk about that in just a second. And I think most of you are here, you know that the draft, I, I've been calling them just draft restoration plans because not everyone understands acronym PIR. Um, but that's what it is, it's an environmental impact report, and it's also an environmental impact statement. The impact report is the state, and the impact uh, statement is the federal. There are some differences in the laws, but for the most part, you come up with good comments for the state. Most of you have probably heard or seen that that document is really big, you know, over 8,000 pages. Start with page one, go through page by page, and just see what people talk about. <laughs> uh, no, this is actually page one, though. Uh, main organization, and then maybe the, 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 just like a couple words, the thing that's most important to you about the Bible that is. Marcia Hansel with the Biome Institute, and I also chair of the Sierra Club Biome Weapons Restoration Committee. And most importantly to me, uh, since the money was mostly spent from wildlife conservation laws on this land, it was the wildlife. And there are nine endangered species and dozens of species on the state special concern list. And uh, to me, that's where they should have started this project, and they didn't. So I'm concerned about what will happen to those species. I'm Rex Frankel. I'm with the Biomedical Ecosystem Education Project. I grew up in Winchester playing the weapons. And uh, I share Marsha's sentiment. Uh, I think that we can restore the Biome Weapons to its natural historic state without expending $200 million. I'm Blake Hall, uh, Biome Greek Renaissance. Uh, I'm here to get a better understanding of what the options are. Mary Kane, Delray Residents Association. James Kane, Delray Residents Association. I'm uh, John McLaughlin. I've been photographing my well man from the uh, insects and birds and wildlife for 15 years now. <laughs> so they are documenting it. So it's important to share it out here. Uh, Brian Reef, uh, representing Delray. Uh, this is Paul, Delray Residents Association. I'm David Warren in the Sierra Club. Uh, Bobby Gold, by Henry Cranksons. Ram Ramona Merriman uh, from BEEP. Jeanette Bosberg, uh, Chair of the Airport Marina Group, Sierra Club. Kathy Knight, um, is the Bionic Ecosystem Education Project and, and Conservation Chair of the Sierra Club's Airport Marina Group. And I've been volunteering for 25 years now to try to um, protect and restore it for the fantastic, gorgeous wildlife out there. Um, and the plants, and not have it hold them, which is what they want to do right now. Miriam Bono, I'm a member of the Airport Marina Sierra Club, and I'm a resident of Playa del Rey, and I get to see what exists now of the wetlands. I'd like it to stay there. Uh, Susie Goodman, I'm <coughs> part of the Sierra Club Airport Marina Group. That's good. I'm um, a member <coughs> of Los Angeles Audubon, but here um, representing LA Audubon. Um, I do restoration, habitat restoration in the Baldwin Hills. My main concern is providing habitat for wildlife. Like where I'm a member of Valley Audubon and the president of the Fellow City right next to the creek here, so I'm interested in curious what's happening for our creek and the environment. Lynn Mossstone, LA Audubon, and the LA uh, School Tours program, and the Open House Docent on Saturday. I'm Cindy Hardin. I'm an employee of Los Angeles Audubon. I'm director of outdoor education, so I handle field trips at Final Wetlands Aconacon. My concern is the expense, the large movement of earth from here to there, and I would like to see more fresh water come out of that. Citizen living in the area, and um, you know, I can read the same sentiments as other folks, me and Mark Parkland. Good. 
Madison Powers, uh, Audubon Vincent, and also I live in Lido Ray, Malaysia, in the Pacific Flyway. And over the past few years, I've seen decline in alarms get on the way. And in addition to the species decline, I also see destruction that's happening to the wetlands in very subtle ways that most people don't see because I'm out in it every day. And it's not, that's not being addressed. And it's everything from the recreational fishing and how they uh, take out a lot of the mussels that are in the creek, plus the damage that comes from the fishing supplies. But also, um, it's turned into a kind of a campground. And, and if we had control of access that had respect for what's there, we'd be in a better place and into perpetuity. Okay, great. Well, in the context of how did we arrive at them? How did you look at the graph they are and decide if we were seeing something that was a concern? So it's not to convince you uh, of that. Uh, does everyone know what SQL is, what it means? I'm going to go through this very quickly. Okay? And I will also give a disclaimer. I'm not a professional SQL person. Okay? Um, the purpose for tonight is to make sure everyone's comfortable, again, to go through the document and contribute. Not that you're going to tomorrow put a shame if you're a SQL lawyer or SQL. California Environmental Quality Act. <coughs> the national equivalent is the National Environmental Protection Act. Again, you're going to see these an analogous right through. I'm probably going to mostly stick to the one term. Okay? There are a lot of people who know a lot about the environment and who think they know a lot about CEQA and have some misunderstandings about it. So just a couple quick things. It's a statute, right? It's not an agency. There's no agency. Okay, it's a statute that requires is to identify the significant environmental impacts of their actions and to avoid or mitigate those impacts if feasible. Now, why is that important? A lot of people lull themselves with a false sense of security because they're like, oh, this is going through CEQA. And they imagine that CEQA is this magical process that takes this horrible project and it cleans it up and by the time it comes out the other end, there's no damage to the environment. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, if you want to build a hotel, on habitat, you have to go through the secret process, and you can very easily get your hotel on the other side. You just have to say, our purpose for the project is to build a hotel. So obviously, no, it's not the most environmentally friendly option. It's environmentally friendly option. And, and by the way, a lot of final EIRs say this. Um, you know, the best thing to do would be to not build a hotel. But your overriding consideration is we bought this land to build a hotel. They build their hotel. Now, what they do have to do, and why secret is a good thing. If they do have to show that they couldn't drastically reduce the impact by maybe lowering it by one floor, right? From going from a 100-room hotel to an 80-room hotel, so there's 20% of the rooms, would they then mitigate against 90% of the damage, right? Just a quick, again, these are hypothetical examples, but somebody buys a big plot of land, some of the habitat's really valuable, some of it's not as valuable, they want to build the hotel in the valuable part so it'll be closer to the tennis courts, right? They probably can't do that because they'll have to do an alternative that says, well, we're going to put the hotel here, save this nice habitat. Gee, now people have to walk an extra two minutes in tennis courts, right? Any court would say, yeah, too bad. You know, build it for the less money you have to. But just to point out, it is not this cleaning process that, that prevents uh, destruction. It's a self-executing statute that's really important. So a lot of people think, again, they love themselves in this false sense of security, that somebody else is doing something. That's not how it works. If you keep going through it, so public agencies are trusted with compliance, that's a subjective thing. Right? So they might even think they're doing a great job, and the public might disagree. Uh, and the provisions are enforced and necessary by the public through litigation. So I know that we all are, I mean, some of us are very angry, why they come to God, in such a litigious society, we live in great if people want to sue each other all the time. But you know what happens is, you know, I'm not going to editorialize too much, but corporations and other folks um, kind of feed off of that narrative to make people think, oh, I'm not the type of person to ever sue. Well, guess what? If you're the type of person who never ever will have to file a lawsuit, CEQA is really going to give them help to you. Because at the end of the day, the agency can take your really good idea and ignore it, and you have nothing to do unless you're willing to say, you know what, I just agree I'm a third party to adjudicate this, right? So the, I, my feeling is that if you're an environmental activist, you can't think of litigation as a lot of that. Um, the Natural Resources Agency does not enforce CEQA, nor does it review for compliance with CEQA and any state of uh, agency actions are subject to CEQA. And there's a little, you know, I'm going to post the, the deck, and so you'll be able to click on these links. 
The Natural Resources Agency is actually the agency that oversees the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, that's the landowner, the State Coastal Conservancy, that's the funder of this project, and most of the agencies that we think of as resource-related agencies. So it's actually, it wouldn't be appropriate, really, it wouldn't be much help. So again, this, is, this slide is really to say, you know, slow to bear, right? only you can decide, you know, if you want to uh, make something better out of this, okay? I'm not going to get into the weeds here. This is a, a regulation. I don't want to get into big legal speak. But if you just look at some of the blue, there's some key things highlighted. Range of reasonable alternatives. It's a very important part of CEQA. And I'm going to discuss a little bit more of that later. And it, another thing I'll say is when you get into litigation, nobody knows what the outcome of the lawsuit is. So you might hear somebody speak with the utmost confidence, and it's like a stop. Nobody knows what's going up or down. Which they tell you they do. And a good example of that is there are cases where somebody sues and sues, but they lose at the trial court, that's one judge. Then they win at the appeals court, that's three judges. Then they lose at the, the California Supreme Court, and that's like seven judges, and you know, it could be four, three. And I was out telling the story if you knew four Supreme Court judges, Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg, and you knew four of them, you asked them a legal question. And they all gave you the same answer. You would think, I just spoke with four greatest legal minds in the country. They all gave the same answer. I now know, you know, the law. You could, that could actually go to the Supreme Court, and you could lose five to four, right? Because the other five judges disagree. So I just always like to say, when it comes to litigation, um, nobody knows how these terms are always defined until you actually go to the case. So reasonable range is something that's always disputed. Um, the next thing, um, Foster informed decision making and public participation. Right? That's key to tonight. That's why we're here. So as you go through, one of the things you should be thinking about is, is this helping me make a decision? Right? Is this helping me figure out what the right thing to do is with this really important decision? And if you have a question or something's unclear, don't assume that it's just because you don't know. It could be because the information is not there. Mm -hmm. we, we've definitely found instances where that's the case. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, that's No ironclad rule. They didn't, they didn't make a rule, right, but there's a bright red line, and if you're on this side, you're okay, and if you're on this side, you're not okay. Every time, it's a case-by-case -case situation. It's going to be situation to this. Okay, this picture, I think I took this, but I don't know because everybody takes this picture. Like, this is a, if you go to Paris to take a picture of the Eiffel Tower, you can go by the one that you take this picture. I think this is mine. You'll see later on the app, there's another website that's a very similar picture. This is a quote from one from the field today. Ecology is complicated and it's difficult to anticipate the different variety of factors that might influence a restoration project. I wish people spoke more often like this, with sort of a sense of you know, not knowing and not being so certain. I sometimes feel like there's way too much marketing uh, around this thing. It's too important for marketing. You should really be doing it like a medical procedure. And you're gonna ask your doctor the questions, right? And if the doctor tries to make you feel dumb and you just don't get it, you're gonna say, you know. You're making them uncomfortable, maybe you're a second opinion. So we want to be thoughtful about this. And I thought this was a thoughtful statement, and so that's why I put it up there. And again, it comes back to what can we do to help anticipate those factors? Because the worst thing to do would be to, to get wrong, and then 10 years from now, we don't have what we thought we were going to get from this process. That's a common yellow throat, it's one of my favorite birds, a very handsome bird. This was taken by uh, Rick Pine, he's another great photographer of the Falcon of Diana. But really, I have to read thousands of pages. No. Uh, in Patricia. But we will. So the land trust, right, in our name, it's a by owner weapons land trust. So obviously we're going to be more focused on something today that, that misses what we did. So we're going to take a look at probably every page, except I'll show you some examples of like there's broad data. Um, we don't have to right? Now these are the page counts. You can see there's the notice availability for page. You get the draft here, 1242, it goes down to all those appendices. Um, and it totals out, and I've seen different counts. Um, and I have uh, 8,209 pages all the time. No, you do not have to read 8,209 pages. So, a lot of pages look like this, right? This page one potentially. That's a, that's a pretty quick read. There's actually quite a few pages like that. But this whole process is just to sort of take away that information. Then there are pages after page after page of like intersections and what the traffic routing is. They have to do that as part of support. But it's Los Angeles, right? There's a lot of traffic creating the ecologic reserve. Right? We're not putting in like Disney World 2 or something like that. So really, if 
you were to go through all those pages, if you even understood it all and took an interest in it, I said, yeah, it's not really going to change the intersections that much. Okay? So you don't have to read all those pages. Okay? Then there's just gobs and gobs of my data. Like there's a whole appendix that's just like 100 pages of noise data. Now, again, that's not to say that noise is important. We have some people here from Del Rey, right? So noise might be important for you from a uh, construction standpoint. But you're probably not going to look through these numbers to figure out what that is. These are obviously very technical numbers. You're going to go through and see what the text that talks about the noise, and you might have some comments about that. Okay, so what do, I guess I have to come out for a minute. What do I need to read? What do you need to read? Um, that depends on your schedule, your interests, and your expertise in anything. The quick answer is you don't have to read anything. Right? You could leave this meeting and say thank you for the bagel. Never open the graph data, all right? So if you decide you want to, you could read a page, you could read two pages, I think if you're like me, you'll start to get into it because it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, but the key is, you know, what are you interested in? And you don't have to be an expert in something. If you're a lawyer, okay, that's a plus. If you're an engineer, an architect, a botanist. When I say botanist, you can be a PhD botanist, or you can be a really experienced club. You don't have to have you know, a degree. Um, and I'll give you, uh, I'm going to use just a quick example. So, Deborah went to a meeting the other night about a project that's kind of separate that's really close to Delray Point. She reminded me of it. I had completely forgotten about it. I went and checked. There's a thing at every draft AR that's called cumulative impacts. You can't, you have to say, we're doing this project and it has impacts. And here are all the other projects and their impacts because people need to understand what's the accumulation of those impacts. And I looked at Delray Point, it wasn't there. I thought, hey, that's interesting. So there's a comment, right? I'm going to say Delray Point's on the cumulative impacts, probably should be. Just so everyone knows, that's where the creek, the Sentinel Creek, the confluence of the Sentinel Creek and the Bayou Creek. There's like a little patch of land there, and they actually want to build a housing development. Bird Island. People know Bird that. Bird Island. <laughs> um, but anyway, so just as a quick example, that's what communication does, right? Because I wasn't even thinking about that. Oh, yeah, and then that made me connect that with cumulative impacts. And I think then all they have to do is say, oh, yeah, we'll add that as a line of cumulative impacts and see if that impacts me. And, and the reason why that's important, actually, is one of the selling points to the community for that um, is a bike bridge that would go from the development over to Area A, but they're also investigating other bike bridges as part of the DIR. So they need to kind of connect the dots there and decide whether we really need two bridges, and if not, then you know, that, that design will change. Okay, so research tips. Start with the table of contents. I think it's a good idea. Okay. Start there. And then when you see something that's interesting to you, I heard people talk about wildlife. So you might start with biological resources. You might even just have a big bird, all right? And unfortunately, because I'm borrowing the uh, library's computer, I can't open up PDFs, so I can't actually open up the graph AR. But has everyone used Adobe Acrobat? So you know how to hit Control F, and you can type it. I highly recommend, this is my way of going through things, and again, everyone's different. But rather than trying to read page after page after page, I would fall asleep like on page five when I did that. I get excited about things. I know dredging is an issue, so I'll type in dredging. And I'll get my, all the references for dredging. I'll so hit next, next, and I'll start to read. And as I'm doing it, I'm taking notes. And you guys all know how you can highlight something in a PDF file, no. make it yellow. Okay, so you just take your mouse, you highlight the text. You right click, you say highlight. And then you right click again, you can say, oh, the pop-up note, and you can type in whatever thought you're having at the time, right? And then that can help you go back, because you can go, write your comments on the side, and you can go through them. And that's one of the things we're doing, to document the, the things that we're doing. Uh, it's certainly very interesting. Digital notes are written if you prefer. The nice thing about digital, it's fine if you're old school, but digital is searchable, right? So you very quickly go back and say, ah, I'm, I do this now all the time. I'm going to press, I know I have to talk about invasive species, I type in invasive, I get all the spots in my notes to talk about invasive, I find what I'm looking for, and it helps me connect the dots. Uh, treat the process, again, like a medical procedure. I'll talk a little more about the sort of, you know, red team, blue team. Don't assume accuracy of data or assumptions, all right? I don't mean to be flippant here, but, you know, we don't want to ignore generals when it comes to military decisions, right? Because they're pretty knowledgeable. We also don't want to say, do whatever you want, guys. You know, keep us out of the loop. Because that can lead to bad decisions. Same thing with the economy. Same thing with, you know, is this uh, offshore oil rig safe? You know, you'll have people saying, oh yeah, yes it is, right? And then it blows up. Oh, no, we forgot about the pressurized valve if this happens. So that's our job, is to say what if. 
Did you guys really cover this? Is this something you really right? This something isn't true. So don't assume. There's no dumb comment. Uh, feel free to share some of feedback. Now, obviously, you know I, I won't be able to you know take everybody's emails and you know all the time. But if you have a question, do feel free to ask me. And I may have seen the page. I may have a bookmark. I may be able to help you out. Um, but you know you can try to you know find the information yourself first. Obviously, it's not efficient. Okay. Um, examples of useful comments. Providing additional information to the administrative record. Okay, that's really important. So. Delray folks. <laughs> By the way, the Delray folks, the Niagara Peak Renaissance folks, team up, we're all on So I just was noticing that I think those two groups. But um, you may have an interest, you know, we were talking um, a little bit earlier today about security. So if you have a security concern, if you don't get it into the administrative record, then later, if you don't like what the final EIR says, it's going to be a lot harder for you to uh, influence that. Okay? So if you have a great example, you guys might have documents about security. You might have records of meetings that you've had, records of discussions. Get those to the administrative record um, so that if later again you need to, you know, you have questions about your city, you can grab that. Suggest improvements or changes. Now, regardless of what you think about the draft paper, regardless of what you think about the state's plans, I think we might all agree you're not 100% perfect. There's something in there, there's some sentence somewhere that could be clarified, right? There's some design element that could be tweaked. So let's do that. Okay, it's worth it. You get $139 million from the Ecological Reserve, the different restoration proposals that are on the table. Uh, the minimum amount per acre is nine, just under a million dollars per acre to restore. Right? So we'd be kind of foolish to do that and not really try to make sure that this thing is, is optimized as much as possible. Okay, point out discrepancies or perceived inadequacies. inadequacies. Seek clarifying language or additional data. So you might just go in, I'll give you an example. I haven't been able to find a parking spot in a parking analysis. So I've looked far and wide, I've searched on parking and park and analysis and study, and I haven't found one. Normally that's something you'd have to figure out how many parking spaces can you actually do. That. I'll get into that later why that's important to me. Um, but the same thing could be with you know, anything. There was actually one appendix, an appendix. Um, where it says appendix B, then the next page says this paid for potentially blank, and then the next page says appendix C. So I'm going to ask you where the appendix B goes. It could just be, you know, it could be a copying error in the number of things. It's not anything that varies, so you can find out what that information is. And then identify typographically, and I almost never get to say this, or topographical errors. And there's actually some topographical uh, maps in the back of Kathy, which really nice to, to bring them down. Um, but again, you can just I wanted to give like a really silly example. If you read one page of the document and there's like a question mark and then a period, which I, I don't know. And you, that's the only thing you do is you say there's a question mark and a period here. It's unclear if this is a uh, you know, question or statement. You send that in, they'll fix it, right? And great, that would be a contribution. Better than not doing anything. Okay, so I just wanted to give an example of a little thing you can do. Now, for anyone, has anyone not ever responded to a draft AR and provided comments? Everyone has? Everyone has responded? No. All right, so this is kind of, I just wanted to give one example. This is a real life example of somebody I know, and I'm going to talk about who it is to purposes to understand the format. What happens is you write your email or you write your letter, okay? It can be an email. You can just type an email to somebody just give a stream without consciousness, and they'll do their best to divide it into what they think are sort of, um, you know, discrete topics. And they'll say, okay, and this one's very helpful then because it's actually numbering it, I encourage that. Um, it says, okay, that's B4, or sorry, is it 8 or B4, B4, B5, B4, 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 and then what they do when they respond to it is they say, <coughs> response A3, here they're saying uh, C above. I just say quickly, it was about snowy plumbers, and the gentleman who made the comment said, you didn't have any information on snowy plumbers, and they said, yeah, we did, and it's you know, B-6, which is another point. Try to find the answer before you put your comment in, uh, so you're not you know, overwhelming them. The team stuff you could have just sorted it out. But anyway, how's the state? But then this observation platforms, and it's making a, a suggestion about, hey, why would you have them on the other side? So now you're looking over the trail to see what you want to see. Why not put them on the inside of the trail so you can actually look down and see the, the, you know, the sand pipers and whatnot? And the response is, be car appreciates the comment we're considering this kind of design. So good, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a response that improves the project. Okay, in my mind. Now, you might think the whole project's terrible and the response you want is right either. That's, 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 that's your perspective. 
But I think we can all agree we want to improve whatever the outcome is, okay? whether that's a wholesale change or a minor change. Does that make sense, the format? Okay, commenting tips, right? Has anyone ever like commented on an internet blog? And then you get down to the bottom and they're not helpful because it's just people like trolling each other. Like, and I see those in the comments to draft ARs, and they're just not helpful. Um, if you say alternative two, you know, is really stupid, or you say alternative two is great, and you say X is you know, alternative X is great, and then everyone thinks it's not great, it's really stupid. All they're going to say is thank you for your comment. It's, it's going to be really great. So we want to try to come up with specific improvements. Uh, site and document page numbers, right? So if you're talking about something, you know, it says something about invasive species you don't think is quite right and you need more clarification, say on page such and such, you say this, uh, my experience is X, right? It could be a bird. It could be like saying, you know, maybe they'll say something about a bird and you'll be like, I'm down there all the time and I was observing and my sense is that, you know, loggerhead strike is there more frequently than what you seem to think based on the terms. Give an example. Already, our main reason why we're defining existing information, right? Don't just, you don't see it on page one, you put your comment in front of the problem. You're not voting on an outcome. That's really important. Secret process is not a vote, okay? You can send a million cards and say, alternative X is the best alternative, and that's not going to necessarily mean that, it's, that that's going to get through a legal change. We're going to just I just wanted to go back one slide. Yeah, the bottom one that says appreciates the comment. Just yep. remember that because I'll make a comment on that. They appreciate the comment. It's not a question. They don't have to answer you. Right. That is true. Yeah. So yep. the importance of questions is opposed to. But well, going back to my administrative record, if you put, let's say for example, if you put. In the administrative record, a study that was conducted on where's the best place to put platforms. Right? Then, if they ignore that study, you could be, it was a really big deal to you. You could say, I don't like your job getting hurt. I'm going to take you to court. Because the substantial evidence is that you should put the platforms on the outside. That would be a kind of tough challenge to win because it's a very subjective thing. But if you don't put that information in, then you wouldn't have an opportunity to do the question. All right, so where was I? So, okay, again, not outcome now. I will say, there are organizations out there. And I'm, I'm not being judgmental. But they have postcards. We also have postcards. I don't want to be here. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, but the postcards that they have are, in my mind, a little too vague. Right? So it's like, I like weapons. Uh, weapons, you know, have, you know, what stuff I agree with. I check off every one. But then you send those in as comments, and I just don't know what the purpose of that is. Because the project team is going to get that and say, you know, okay, thank you for the postcard. But it's not specific to an alternative. So that's just my perspective. I don't know that that's that helpful. But I don't think it's necessary right now to, to try to jump on anyone's bandwagon. The purpose now is to try to be as open minded as we can and read through and find pros and cons. I found some good things that I'm all about. I talked about and I found some things that are concerned. You know, these post products get to gum up the works. Uh, I just find that's just me. I find that to be not the way to do things, right? You people working really hard and they have a lot of comments. Just like shooting comments to just keep you busy, it, it, it just it, it doesn't work in the long term my uh, perspective to try to stop a project that maybe you don't like. So, you know, again, that's 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 uh, my my uh, two cents. And then avoid the bandwagon like a chain. Again, it's not time to pick up the red pom pom and blue pom pom. That's not to say that people can't have very passionate, and, and there are a lot of people who have been studying this for years. I'm not trying to say that they shouldn't have their opinions. I'm just saying that, that we have time still to keep open minds. And this is a slide that I use oftentimes, right? Light switch. Uh, good decision or bad decision. Right? This, is a, this is a little simplistic off on. And I always joke if, if, if you went into a, a, a plane, and that was the, the cockpit, you were pretty nervous, right? Playing up, playing down, right? So not get you that. I would argue that the process that we're looking at is very complex. Wow. And it's really like that. And it's, it's probably even more complex than that too. It's like, okay, this is the kill deer trial, this is the long range strike that I like to get down the species level. Now that's not a game to be intimidated and say that you've got to like in your comments, you know, have this big complicated matrix. It's just that they there are trade-offs, like right? there are pros and cons. No matter how much you like or don't like an alternative, some species are going to benefit. If, if you're a water and you like this kind of habitat and that diminishes, 
And if you know if you were going to you were sitting on that, you were lying on a trike, you'd say, hey, I'm no longer on a trike now. But there might be fish, there might be aquatic species, there are all kinds of balance. And what we want to do is try to optimize it as best we can. Right? Get, and, and everyone's going to have a different value perspective on that. And my favorite word is X, and they also, again, they, they're much more into the lizards. Not, no one's going to get their distinct vision if you're not If we try to optimize it, at the end of the day, I'll be happy if we can keep special interest considerations out of the equation. We're all honestly doing our best Authorize this thing for ecology, as broad as that is, and I think that's the best we can ask for. Okay, so how do I submit comments? The easiest way is by email. If you want to type up a letter and mail it in, that's fine. They'll take it, they'll scan it, and they'll do the same thing with it. They'll break it in the comments. And again, if you email them a PDF, and you can even just put it right in, they don't even have to have an attack. Just type the email. Um, we'll probably do a PDF, right? You can kind of have a fairly normal response. And it'll be good to get on it and all that good stuff. Again, CEQA and NEQA, two different contacts. You can probably send your comments to both. You know, we're, we're going to have a lawyer look at ours to make sure we're covering both of the NEQA and federal and not miss anything. But I would say for the people who are just are trying, to, trying to chip in, uh, don't worry about that too much. Okay, so I want to stop here. I've got more slides, but I want to stop here to say, does this make sense? What questions do you guys have? Is there something that you Interested in about the commenting aspect of it that I didn't cover? Okay. Uh, um, are you going to still talk about the public comment times? Because if not, I think that one of the most important things that people don't realize about a CEQA process when it's done by a state agency is that at this time they are planning only one public comment time. That's November 8th. And whereas if you're in a city or a county and you have a project to comment on, usually after the final environmental impact report is, and all your comments are answered, they usually have another one <coughs> where there's actually an elected body that is accountable to us who makes who has a hearing. They're not going to do that this time, at least not as currently planned. And they don't have to. It's sort of a loophole. It, Typically, when you go to a, a CEQA classroom, so to speak, um, you are taught to try and turn what you say as a comment into a question. I mean, as, as uh, Walter said, as much data as you can do put in to support what your comment is, that can be very, very helpful. But always try to pose a question so that they cannot say, thank you, nice comment, and then move on. If you ask it in a question, they are they are held to respond to you. Um, and as far as these meeting goes, typically, I mean, even as you all know, this is a very controversial project. It's been forever. Um, we have grassroots has written letters and letters saying, even under the Army Corps auspices, that if it's a controversial project, they are bound to have hearings 
to, bring, to vet issues before the public. So if you have any letters that you have ever written any one of these agencies to say, let us have a hearing on this, please put it into your comments and say, why did you never respond to my query to say, we need a hearing on this because we don't understand this, 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 and this. And it doesn't have to be, you know, as, as Walter was saying, it doesn't have to be scientific. But the fact that they haven't done what they claim they would do in this process by reaching out to the public um, is a big deal. And it will likely be part of later litigations and things like that that have to tr at least hold them to what they said they took all the public's money for um, in this project. But um, I was just going to say uh, also, uh, and now it just slipped yeah, out. Hold your thought. I'm going to go through some more stuff. Kathy, just put it yeah, uh, Oh, also what we've been asking for is besides um, everything else is a 120-day is a extension. Because the current the current deadline to comment on this, 8,000 pages is the day after. Uh, I got some news on that today. Oh, oh. So there is going to be an extension, but they wouldn't tell me how long. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be surprised if it didn't go until these January. It would be silly to have it end on December 24th. Right? That might be so my guess is that they're adding at least 60 days, possibly longer. I know that um, the city council resolution is online now. There's a Santa Monica resolution online asking for even, even, even longer, so March 1st to Santa Monica, and then all the way up to the additional 120 days is the city request. So I don't know what it's going to be, but it's not, I, I'd be shocked if it was never on the 24th. And they told me there's going to be some extension. Okay. We need to keep asking for 120 additional days. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to end up with two months of holiday time, and it'll be difficult to get people to. Yeah, just, so the land trust, Position sort of knows. We asked for 60 days, and we said that if other organizations make a good argument for more, we said more. So we didn't want to say, well, well we're good after 60, so we have everyone else. You know, we, we're, we're putting you know, a lot of people on it. Um, but yeah, getting the extra time. What we said too was to just balance, because there is a balance. So, so many things, there's a balance. They do have a legitimate desire to want to keep the ball rolling. I presume there are probably some money issues in terms of who can consult and retainer and that sort of thing. But they took quite a long time, right? And when they each time they delayed, which was many times, they said we are prioritizing the specific quality of the content over the timeline. And so we're kind of asking, okay, do the same thing now. Prioritize the quality of the content. That means give us time to make sure it's good. Walter, well, can I say one more thing? Yes. Uh, also, on when you write your comments, send them to both agencies, right? Send your comments to both the uh, state fish and game. Yes. Uh, fish and Wildlife and, and the uh, right. Just audio both. to both. Yeah. And um, also, uh, on the 120 day extension, they took over five to ten years to do this this uh, project. Oh, 13. This, yeah, 13. This all, 13 years to do this. So for us to get, you know, 120 day extension is not a big deal. I mean, compared to what they've used. And also, uh, final thing is to maybe ask, to, I think we should be asking for freshwater alternatives. Okay. So, um, let me just go through some more slides here. And again, stop me. The whole point is this for you guys to make sure you feel comfortable. Um, quick disclaimer. So I'm going to go through our initial reactions to the draft are really just a spur discussion. And I hope some people will have different perspectives. It's not about us just sharing our perspective. But disclaimer, we have not taken our comments to our board of directors. Right? So these are my and, and other staff's initial reactions. Um, I want to start with the fact that, that this was a lot of effort. Okay, so regardless of what you think of the document, recognize that it takes a lot of work to create a document that's a document. Right? Um, I was in the military and then I was in the software industry for a while, and so I'm a firm believer in we tell people thank you for your effort, but they have to go by the by the deliverable, right? A plumber could come in and you know, God bless her or him, you know, work for ten hours. If your sink is leaking when they leave, you know, you gotta say the, the sink is still leaking. So you know, it's always nice to acknowledge the yeah, A lot of people work very hard on this. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're proud of it. Kind of my opinion, um, and again, I'd love to hear your feedback. My opinion is this is like the version 1.0 of the draft AR. So I don't think it meets the basic legal needs of the draft AR. So if they tried to push it straight to the final AR, I think they'd be in trouble. I think it's um, better if they come back. And this is where I would say to everybody, if you love alternative one or two or three, and you just want to get it done, 
I would encourage you to take a step back and say, what's the fastest path? Because my, my daughter, she's six now, she plays shoots and ladders. She's always so sad when she gets to the top and then slides all the way back down. <laughs> we don't want to do that, right? So if we're trying to get somewhere, wherever that is, then we don't want to just be spinning down a dead end. I believe that about half of what we again, that's my two cents, let me know what's right now. Um, I think it lacks a reasonable range of alternatives because I think the three alternatives, so there's a no project alternative, which is do not And it includes, it really is, they say, no trails, no access. They've really been clear that, hey, you're going to get nothing with the new do no project alternative. And then there are three that do require levy removal. Now I'm going to tell you, there's some people bothered by this, but Land Trust has not decided that, that we're not going to support levy removal. We haven't decided that we're definitely not going to support any kind of agreement uh, because we're just not there yet. We're still looking at, you know, we want to look at the design, we really want to understand and get better information about climate change. But I will say that you have three alternatives that are removing the levies, and that's, I was told them to do this from the current Corps of Engineers, that this is the most complex project that they've done. And so you've got nothing, and then you jump all the way up to alternative three, which is like the next, you know, less ambitious. And it's extremely ambitious because you're knocking down flood control measures. Let me just finish this point. Which I'm here. sorry, just be careful of what you say when you say they did it. The Corps didn't do this. These are consultants hired by a private business in the Bay that created these reports that the Corps then commented on. There are many things that the Corps and the county are both saying, I'm not liable for this. So. Right. Just be careful who you My say. My only point is, yes, that these alternatives, and you're right, it's consultant. A lot of people think that you know, this is all being done by California for Fish and Wildlife. It, it is mostly being done by private consulting firms. Mm -hmm. But the point being on this point is, yes, in the court, um, whether you like the alternatives or not is really not the issue. The issue is, so what we were looking for is a comparative, okay, if we knock down the levees, we get this. If we don't knock down the levees, we get this. <laughs> What's going to happen with this habitat over here to be? And so I, I don't want to get too deep into the actual plans right now, but what I would say is that I think speaking, I think fairly on behalf of the project team, what they would argue is, okay, listen, if you don't knock down the levees, all that beautiful habitat you see when you come to Los Angeles slide on over the rocks is going to be dead in eight years because climate change will force us to shut the culverts and there's not going to be any water coming out of the tube. Now, I need a lot more information about that, right? But I'm going to take it seriously. I'm going to say, okay, you got my attention when you said that all of this habitat's being cut off and dying during the mud flat. Help me understand it a little bit better because I'm still not understanding why you have to shut the floodgates. So again, that'll be a comment that we say is, could you put this in more accessible language? Because again, I think we're not going to be doing it. Put more accessible language, really walk people through. What we don't want is for that, if they started with a conclusion, and then they didn't really even give a legitimate effort to think of other ways that they might be able to maintain that. So, question. You mentioned uh, <clears throat> the two words that I'm often accused of, and I want to be really clear with people. Uh, do nothing, it means do nothing. And the, the alternative of no project in this case is not a do nothing. In fact, when they say, oh, you won't get trails if we don't do this, well, they already built a trail in Area A, um, and they didn't have to do any NIR for that trail. So there are lots of things you can do on this land without EIRs. You can, when they brought the wolves back to Yellowstone, they didn't need a, a federal and environmental impact statement. They needed a recovery plan. So wildlife recovery is a whole different thing. You don't need EIRs or EISs. You need recovery plans. And so when they say you don't get anything, it's not, it's not the case. And we're going to be making a list of all the things you can do without the EIR. So that's actually a good point. I'm going to get, let me just knock to the points in between here. So uh, early our, our alternatives dismissed based on what we do as overly narrow objectives. And that's a big thing with SQL. You define your objective. Here's what you can't do. You can't say, OK, guys, we, we're going to paint the school building. You can paint it whatever color you want. You just whatever the color is has to be minus of blueberries. Right? Because that's kind of constraining the choices, right? So it says, oh, look at the choices that we get. It is our opinion that they dismissed some, some early alternatives that were a little bit in between, right? So again, not saying that that's what we would support, but creating more of a range based on, I'm going to try to be fair about the way I say this is, I hear this argument a lot, because people are talking about, you know, 
Marsha and Wayne, so forth, they're saying, well, what they want to do is all this, you know, millions of pounds of, uh, millions of cubic feet of dirt that we want to move bulldozers, they want to do that with wheelbarrows. Yeah, and that's going to take, I, and I know, <laughs> that's going to take a million years. Now, setting aside whether or not we need to move land or not, which we're still considering, it is not the case that anyone is suggesting doing that with bulldozers. But the people, again, who are saying that, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the, 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 the slogan, no bulldozers, because I can put a bulldozer instantly in there to get rid of the parking lots between the towns. <laughs> um, but to me, it's not about the tools, it's about what we want to do. And so I think what those folks are saying is we don't necessarily believe in moving all that. Dark. So it's sort of a uh, circular argument, so we, we have concerns with that. Soil. Soil. Thank you. Uh, we have concerns about funding and permitting, and I forgot to put this in there, but also timeline. Okay, we're told that the funding doesn't exist yet. I think it's 190 or 80 something million dollars. I think it's for the most expensive. The permitting, um, I have a slide on that just next, but there's a lot of permits they have to get afterwards that, that could be problematic. Again, that shoots and ladders thing, right? We're very sensitive to that. Um, there are some special interest land uses. I'm going to talk about one of them. Heavy marketing around release. I, I do not like marketing when it comes to science. I, just, I can agree with you 100%, but when you start putting flashy stuff in front of me, I get nervous. Um, access, stewardship, and security being used to garner support early inside the future. So again, we might support those nine features, but not, do not need to knock down the levees to get trails, to remove the trash, to get people in there to clean invasive species. What I want to hear them say is, yeah, you're right. You know, they know that those are really popular things. I want them to say, you're right, that's it. But you do need to knock down the levees to do X, Y, Z. And let me explain to you, you know, in accessible language why. And then people can make a decision. Some people might say, I agree with that. Some people might say, oh, now I get it. Yeah. Really and again, we're not here tonight to decide not to lay these other things. Um, and then key assertions in my mind require more accessible things. I basically said that with the accessible language. Patricia. Um, I think you also have to pay attention to what's not in DEIR, and it's certainly a lot of what grassroots has already said already, but when you bring up to have levies changed or not have levies changed, um, and how much is this going to cost, um, the original bonds for this had 25 million set aside, and that 25 million after the acquisition funds, roughly 140 million, was to do the studies and have the project done. And there are parameters in that that cited what was to be done. So this switch happened in roughly 2006, 2008, in which we were left out of the loop by and large. Um, and this 200 million that we're looking at, they don't have funding for, as Tom Ford said the other night. Um, and just be aware of that as far as process. Did this adhere to proper process? But I also wanted to bring up, one of the things for me is the levees themselves. Let's just say you wanted to have new levees. I want to remind you that the levees themselves are gigantic. I've, I, I, I can, we can send out uh, I did a PowerPoint showing what they are. They're large. They're part of some of these drawings here. But they range for like 200 feet. And in addition to that, you've got an extra 50 feet or 20 feet that is an easement. Levees, which we also have a video on, I show one up in Oregon, they are mowed grass. Because the Army Corps, with regard to levees, you're not allowed to have animals burrowing into them because they can breach them and cause them to have all kinds of problems. So you literally have to have animal control go in there and be able to use poisons and whatnot to kill part of the creatures that are part of the ecosystem that is Biona. And per the numbers that I have seen, it's, it's got to be, you know, it's between 20 and 25% of the habitat that would be taken out of Biona and put into essentially a, an animal vector control situation. And I think it's important to note, if you go on the and it's not in the DEIR. If you go on the biorestoration.org website, the watercolor depictions that have been for some time, I think show that there is quite a bit of But again, I, I would like everyone, if you hear an idea in this room, go back to that document. And if, and if somebody said something, say, hey, you said something in this meeting, can you tell me what page of that document it is? That's how we'll make sure we're kind of keeping ourselves you know, I don't use the word honest, we're all being honest, but that's, it's better if you read it in the document yourself and you're like, oh, hey, Patricia, what she's saying is here on page three. And I happen to know that what she's saying is true. There's a description of the Now, again, 
part of me follows me that I'm okay. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. It just means we need to be aware of that right. thing in that con con. If you're going to kill it, no. We have to balance it out. If we have the wrong, if we don't understand what the weight is on this scale, the weight on this scale, how, how do we possibly make great decisions? It's not about what you decide, it's about making sure you decision. So just to move on here quickly. Um, yeah. um, do you know, we, in 2012, they took our notice of preparation comments? And what we thought should be done, do you know if they ever responded to them? Yes, yeah, so they're in the they're in yeah, the, they're appendix A. No. Oh, okay. Appendix A is two documents, they're really big. Okay. I again I read through them. It's you know, I I get excited about this stuff, so I'm gonna read the whole document. But it's good to go back and see what people said. Uh, but the answer to the question is no, because John Davis and myself had extensive things that we asked them to review and it's just not no no just the comment sorry if you said you should do this i'm not saying that they did that i'm saying if you said you they should do this that they put your thing in the scoping requirement and, and then so your comments are in there not to do this but to review this in light of whatever they plan to do and right. there is no review of what you ask them to review right. two different things they didn't do what you asked them to do but they did put your request in the, in the review so it's in no. the okay. no did you send the material? Yes. Is, there, is what you wrote in, in that document? In part. We're not sure yet if everything is in there, but they did not include it in the DEIR from a standpoint of being responsive to that. I get that distinction. So you're saying I want the building to be read, and I'm saying they said Patricia said I want the building to be read. I'm not saying they painted the building. No, they only left our documents in there, in that section. There's nothing in the DEIR reflecting that they're in there. No, they're saying the same thing. They're saying the same thing. Definitely the same thing. I, all I'm saying is that if you wrote comments, they should be in the, in the scope of the report, just the comments themselves. Actually, according to Todd, who's a secret attorney, he says they're not bound to have to do that. So if you did put things into the scoping, you should check to see if they're still there. But in addition, especially if they're not there, put them in again for your comments, is what our attorney said double, to us. Good to double check. Yes. All right, let me just talk about this question. We're talking about permits. This is because because they supposedly have stuff. to respond. Next time. Yes. Okay. So um, this is because some of the coordinators website talks about four-way permit, and that only in all the you know, rivers and, and harbors in the United States type stuff. But this is a permit that they have to get. They haven't gotten it. And so a concern that I have is that we can go through again this big long process and see what this is. is Section 14 of the Rivers Harbor Act of 1899, as amended, notified, blah, 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 finds that the Secretary of the Army may, upon the recommendation of the Chief of Engineers, grant permission other end use for permanent or temporary alteration or use of any use cases of the project. Who knows who the Secretary of the Army is? <laughs> Patricia. Actually, I don't know his name right now, but we do have letters to and from him. Yeah, okay. I have to look at all my stuff. There hasn't been a new one appointed yet. And I'm not going to get into politics tonight. But <laughs> if you read the news today about EPA, by the way, this is a national issue report, right? It's not going to be a national issue report. There's another one in Narragansett today. They had a seminar tomorrow, or today or tomorrow. And some EPA people are supposed to speak and talk about climate change, and they got yanked. So my only point here is there's not even a Secretary of the Army, there's an acting Secretary of the Army. So we don't know if that Secretary of the Army is going to say, because by the way, there's a lot of climate change discussion in the project, right? So we just don't know. It's obviously not the environment. So that's why it would be nice if we again had some other plans that we could at least fall back on. Uh, so okay, very quickly, for time or something, again, we have to time. We all know it was acquired in 2003. I use this slide last night. Right? If you were in first grade in 2003, you're junior in college now. There's a lot of time lost. This actually, you know, I kind of do this as a funny thing. It really kills me. My kid's six now, and I do not want to wait until she's in college to put this all done. And I'm going to tell you, we're not, every time, it's kind of like, oh, we're supposed to support. I'm going to tell you, we're not. I, I, will, I wish we were. But even if they get all the comments, it's going to take them, as Director Bonham of CDFW said at the Fish and Game Commission hearing, weeks ago, they're probably going to spend most of next year okay, put them together because there's going to be a lot of complex things we're going to be asking to analyze you know, architectural things. Then they're going to have to do the final year. There probably will be litigation. I, mean, I put this out earlier. I don't, I don't know if you know or won't. It depends what the final year says. Um, I think they'll have to do the draft year again probably. Then they got to go through all those permitting phases now. I want to say it's very easy to just sort of be a nice, you know, uh, 
too many obstacles. I do understand that if you want to send somebody to the moon, you can't just say, oh my gosh, we have to design a spaceship. I mean, you know, so I, I don't want to be, I don't want to fall into the trap of just saying can't, can't, can't. I do just want to say, we're pretty far away. And why is that important? Uh, this, this, I put this actually with that being spoke. This is a meeting we had three years ago. And this was about security and access, which I know security, uh, which I know is important to some folks in the room. And it was a great meeting. You can change the rug, but it's this room. And we had four law enforcement agencies. We had California Highway Patrol, we had Department of Wildlife we had an LA Sheriff, we had an LAPD. Uh, we had elected officials, and the whole thing was that it's dangerous to have these encampments and these bike ramps in this in this And then when I was born today, I guess that some of these people have a the trail, and I've heard other stories about things happening. And so how do we fix this? And I'm not trying to be negative, I'm just saying, we had this right meeting three years ago, there was a big rush of activity, it kind of died down, and this is the cycle, and it goes up for six months, and then something happens, oh my gosh, we've got to clean it up, they clean all the trash out, they say, we clean 15 tons of trash out, and then they people forget about it. I don't think that's sustainable, and I think we spent the last 12 years waiting, you know, and everyone's saying, oh, well, when the restoration comes, when the restoration comes, I think You don't need a DEIR to do what you're talking about here, though, so I'm all for that's being cool. dead by the time this thing is done properly, and to what they promised the public. My, my point is, not to rush anything, my point is we yes. can be doing short-term things. Yes. And again, I get very kind of sad when I go back to these things. I wish I had a time change so. to go back to 2005. Uh, oh, so they actually have a stewardship and management plan. Yeah, so and yeah. the state pay for it. Prepare for state coastal conservancy department. You should take sales. And what it basically says is, use the community that you have. Use that really passionate community you have to go in there and take care of invasive species, trash, right? Get educational out there. If, if people are out there, it's like I used to do always the analogy of attic. If you look in the attic, you have mineral. And as soon as you open it up, like a spider lands in your shoulder, you're like, not being a mistake, I'm not going to That gets worse and worse and worse. So if somebody gets beat up on the bike trail and somebody else says, wow, well, you know what, I can't ride my bike. Not, I've had a scuffle with somebody down there. Um, and it's not fun, I just dropped my daughter off at preschool. So I still got the bike trail, and I'm going to do some other things, and I get the scuffles again. I can easily have my daughter in my bike trail. But the last thing we want is people to say, you know what, I'm not doing that. Because all that means is the cobwebs get bigger than the If we can reclaim, right, this idea that this is not a preserve, this is a place to go and enjoy nature. Yes, but we're a little bit of a patch that we have to go over it. We have to go and make sure we're clearing out the syringes and that's something that no one wants to keep the stuff in the syringe. But these are all solvable problems in the short term. We did a nature camp this summer for uh, disadvantaged youth, and we couldn't even get into the garage preserve for a day. Cindy was nice enough. She had. She said, oh, you know what? I'm back from vacation. I can get you on Thursday. Another group had, I think, was had like 10 kids that were in there. It's like, hey, it's a pretty big reserve. We can probably go up in there. But it didn't happen, and a lot of it, I think, is politics. Um, but we can do a lot of these things in the near term. And so I would argue that the restoration, as fast as we might go or might not go, is, is years away, and we shouldn't squander any more of this time. And I think that's true from an ecological perspective, but also you know, from the neighborhood folks. You know, you're know, you going to see a change. And it's not just getting the law enforcement agencies together you know, for a quick quick rush and then forgetting about it is his, his people like Jonathan, he doesn't just take pictures every six months and then go out and do something else like that. He's out there every day. I'm out there most days. We notice things. But right now I have to notice things from the bike trail. So I don't notice if somebody's sitting at a homeless camp underneath a tree, maybe until three months later when they get so bold that the trash starts to spawn um, of, of the encampment. If we're out there walking, we can see these things and I just very quickly put some the impression. This is all about the decision-making process of somebody. And I, again, I understand there's a very important compassion issue, a social issue for homelessness. I'm not trying to be callous for that. Um, but if they can come in and live for three months before they get arrested, that's not such a bad out equation for them. That's not such a, a, a bad thing. If they come in and pretty quickly someone says, hey, I'm sorry, there's a lot of reserve. I go hiking with my daughter here. You, know, you just can't be here. And the next day they're getting noticed. And 10 days later, you know, they're, they're being removed. Hopefully, because there's a lot of organizations that can help those people try to find, you know, a place to go. 
Um, but that can't just happen every six months. So this is just part of that stewardship management. We're not allowed to do that anymore. We have not, we haven't been allowed to go in and clear a cast for me. I've been doing it with another group with a very tiny part of the reserve. If we could go out there with weed branches and clear a cast for me, like I would be doing it every day for free. And I could just get out there without getting a trespassing ticket. And so it's a little bit bothersome that then the draft AR would say, oh, this thing's overrun with invasive species, and well, California that can't couldn't possibly be here because it's not uh, invasive species. Well, you're not letting us take it out, so let's, let's at least get a, a right section. Uh, that's super cool. Well, it's kind of along what you're saying. Is, is there visibility of what can be done? And is there a plan to do those things in parallel that can be done? There is no group right now, there's no single group, and I think we should, we should have it, but we need to get agencies on board, because without access, you know, you're just whistling for the wind. Um, so, yeah, we should have it. We should take that 2005 plan, update it if we need to, right, it's 12 years old, and start, and we just need to start demanding. We've been trying, you know, we don't, we don't want to push too hard, because we're also trying to, you know, do things the other ones, we're trying to take the agencies off. Um, but at some point, we just have to say, you know what, we're at a summer camp, and we want to have it in the wetlands, we want to get you know, people into the wetlands, and how do we do it? So we're going to need more than just the land trust asking for it. We need to really consolidate and move the elected officials and different groups speaking up and saying the same thing. Okay, very quickly, I know we're getting into the, you know, the, the later hours here, and I want to make sure that we have time to talk at the end. This is the one thing that I am going to editorialize on. We have made a decision about these parking lots and the proposed parking lots. And they're just inappropriate. And does everyone remember the whole Annenberg Foundation thing? Oh, no. This is a similar thing. It's really interesting. It just it reflects badly, I think, on our stakeholder community that stuff keeps happening. And I'm, I'm looking in the mirror here. I think we let this stuff happen. I just don't think we're strong enough as a stakeholder community. And, um, and I'm kind of embarrassed because this happened since, since we acquired the land. I only really figured it out what was going on like a year ago. And I'm kind of embarrassed because I do this every day. It took me that long to figure out what was going on with these parking lots. So um, to the right is a lot of trike, right? really awesome word. It's in area A, so you can find it not too far from this parking lot. Let me talk a little bit. Does everyone know which parking lots I'm talking about? Post parking garage. I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. And we do have postcards for this that we would like you to fill in. It's very specific. I'm going to, yeah, I've got a picture for that. First, we just say it's in the VR, right? So everything I want you to know, it's not just and you can imagine They want to put the first ever in any ecological reserve in the country a three-story park. Now, we're starting to get whispers that they realize that was a bad idea and that maybe they've already decided that until they make that official, we're not going to let up. We're going to talk about the parking garage. Um, and it doesn't even say why. It says, I, I took the other page out, so it says maybe 302 parking spaces, 20 feet for the public <coughs> cars, uh, up to 10 feet for the public fish wildlife. Great at the fish and wildlife, and the fish and harbor, you know, peaks and harbors. We're talking that's a gray area. And then 273 spaces for the calling of public access community. And I know that they're not going that so people can come and go on that. And I've got emails. Um, so quick dates, I'm not going to go through all these. Created in 1984 for the Olympics, right? Meant to be temporary. Now the Olympics are coming back, but it wasn't meant to be like, let's save up for 19, you know, 2001 and back. In 88, they decided Fisherman's Village, the, it was a pretty bustling place at the time, and they said, hey, all our employees are parking in this lot, and our customers don't have a place to park. So they said, let's ask Hughes property, because it was private land at the time, can we park over there? They said, yes, they got a coastal development permit, which was supposed to be temporary, and they paid it. And in 2003, the state acquired the land, and the leases were terminable. In other words, the, the agreement is, hey, there's these existing leases, and you can say no to this. You can just say, hey, thanks, guys, we have your opportunity to park here. Now you're done. They didn't do that. The key thing is in 2005, when the land became the ecological reserve, the Department of Fish and Wildlife said, don't worry, we're going to study this. Those are the exact words. There's existing park leases in the county. These are not typical. That's understated. But we kept them on because they came with additional land now. So those will be analyzed in our restoration plans as their accountability. At that time, compatibility. At that time, everyone thought the restoration plans were coming out like in the next year or two. Nobody thought it was going to be 12 years. And so 12 years later, the plans came out, and they didn't analyze it. But they did it in the opposite direction. They said, hey, we're actually going to put a three-story garage there. Every single alternative, other than the no project, includes a three-story garage. No alternative envisions taking 
the land, the, the paper out and restoring it to habitat. Now here's what's particularly problematic about that. So again, just a little bit of a layout of the, the spaces and how they break down. And a lot of it is for employees of the shops across the street. So I'm not against these places. I have lunch there. But if you work at Whiskey Reds, you go to park in the Bio Wetlands Ecological Center, a land that was acquired for $130 million for conservation, that has been left paid now for 12 years. And shame on, shame on us, frankly, for not building something about it more quickly. Um, but that, so that's the one use. And there's also some sheriff's department uses. I get that's it's not really a gray area, but it's a harder thing to tackle. Okay, here's where the things are. So you might have questions on these other ones. So this is area A. If you ever know where Fisherman's Village is, Speechy Way. And these are the parking areas. You can see this is the sheriff's station. A lot of sheriffs and beaches and harbors park down here. 20 beaches and harbors spots here. This is all commercial. So this is all the restaurants and parks across the street. They walk, there's not even a crosswalk. They go across the street past empty spaces. Right? So these, this line is almost never full. This ocean is tolerant. This part up here is almost always empty. Even on the most busy Saturday afternoon when they have live music, that's empty. So why couldn't they just park up there? Because they want to build a hotel there. Uh, and so what I say is that you talk about where the sheriff and this is a public safety issue, we just don't have enough room, there's no menu, so they actually send this in a letter. And look, I love law enforcement. If they said, look, we have no place to park our police cars, and you park in your, you know, maybe we pave some of your backyard to park, I might say, well, gosh, I really you know, need to have a place. But then, excuse me, found out that there was another parking lot, because I would like to park there, like, oh, there's a Juniper Hotel there. Sorry, no, uh, I, I know you cannot park in my backyard because some developer wants to throw a hotel there. So it's really pretty egregious. And, um, okay, so that's just a zoom in. And again, you can go through Google Earth, right? It's not like one time. I didn't go there. You know, that's not even my picture. There. So it's not like there was a picture taken of flying in. Or like, uh, just it's just I want to point out there are other parking lots along there, Fiji Way, that are free parking lots that are usually pretty empty yeah. to be able to park in as well. Yeah. well this and is Dock 52. Yeah. This is Dock 52. That's a public parking right now that's free. It's free. That's where they were going to put things in the course. Yeah, like they they want to build up the marine. Not center, but it's free parking. parking. So there's no yeah, need for that. But even when they did, the Coastal Commission said, oh, there's a land. Again, I have found parking studies. They're not in the draft AR, but they say that the lots are underutilized. It's, it's quite bothersome when people get up. And I don't want to, you know, share it in this actually kind of so <laughs> I, I always like when public servants are a little bit more uh, you know, open on stuff. Anyways, okay, so this email, this from 2011. This is before the whole secret process kicked off. I know there's another whole secret process that happened, but before the one right now. No, it's part of the one building, that is now. Discussions about building a parking structure in connection with the development of Fisherman's Village, right? It's like, not, it's not a great idea. And then down below, DFG is finalizing, or near finalizing, of course, but not true at the time, right? The development of the bio Yes, development. No, it doesn't say restoration, by the way. Yeah, and a lot of people think of the, the use that you're saying. That's what it is. Uh, of the bio wetlands that is connected but it is concerned that the environmental groups might reject the plan if it were announced that the parking lot would be sold. Well, yeah, of course. But, and they didn't tell us. It no wasn't, knew about yeah, this. it wasn't in the original. It's not in the notice of preparation. If you went, and I didn't go to the August 16th, 2012 meeting that was outdoors and all the groups were set up, there was nothing there about the parking lots or the parking garage. The and only reason we discovered it was from a Public Record Act request. That I did. And we did learn about it from Patricia, and then, we, and then from there we, we, we've done quite a few, but yes. But they actually have a confidentiality agreement that they made everyone sign to keep us from getting further information within the past couple of years. So I, I do a lot of public records act requests in front of a lot of lawsuits. The this has not been a transparent process, I, I can just tell you. Um, okay, this is April 16, 2012. My own ZR is expected to be up to public comment early in the summer. I was again, I read this in just not crazy. Okay. At least we're at least it's up now. Um, Rick would like us to get back in. So this is after all the public commenting, the scoping commenting. Right? So notice the preparation that people can comment and say, do this or don't do this. And none of us had the information. So Rick would like us to get back in this week and what we'd like to see in the future of the area of parking lots. Um, you can't do that. You can't push the public out of the process like that. You can't say before the thing, don't tell anyone. And then after the thing, you have to sort of them. This is, I believe, the permit for which the parking lots were built required them to be removed. We got the temporary. 
right? These are temporary parking lots. The coastal development permit says approximately five years from 1988. So, you know, approximately gives them a little bit of wiggle room, but probably not 27 years or whatever it is. Um, so then they talk about some of the options discussed. Leave them as is, state or county, right? You have to get the permits. Build a parking structure under a long term agreement, right? So that's permit. Um, for which legislation will be needed. Or three, eliminate the parking lots and restore habitat. Well, I vote for number three, yes, please. but we never got that choice, and that's not in the draft. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So somehow, hey, Patrick, this is another one of our board members, Patrick Davenport. Yeah. That's, that's not, um, was needed to get the approval to get the, the levels taken yeah. This was a quick problem. There's, there's a lot of quick problems. Again, I'm not saying it to be judgmental. It's, it, it, there's a lot of great There's a lot of politics. Some of it's probably unavoidable, but you know, it's our job to dig it up and see what's there. Okay, so now what, and here's the thing I want, right? So when I first read about this, and this is what they were hoping for, is I read about the, the how they're gonna reduce the footprint. So I'll say sure. hey, they're gonna give us some land back for some restoration. And so this is the land that if they, if, if they get to build a three-story parking garage, then they can go ahead and give it this 0.8, somewhere in other places in 0.68, uh, bit of land back to us. Well, there's a big problem with that. Though. First of all, to go back to my analogy, right? So your neighbor comes and says, hey, I have some friends coming for the weekend. Can they take park, you know, in the driveway over here? Sure. Well, now, oh, now they've decided they want to live here full time. <laughs> but we'll give you one of your two spaces back if you let us build it. You know, it's like, no, it's my driveway. So A, that's the wrong benchmark. We want it all back, except for what's going to support the ecological curve. All right? And then the second thing is, these are the perimeter levees that will get built by, uh, I think all three of the plans roughly have the same area A perimeter levee. Well, this is, this is the, they already have that situation. So this is the part that they're going to restore, that little bit right there. And it's going to be a road on one side, a perimeter levee on the other side, and then parking lots on, on the two other sides. So you get this in San Jose, you two parking lots per road, yeah, you know, five, I think you're already 10 foot levy. Um, that's a pocket park. Now, where this gets interesting is on the other side, if they do this, right, this is what they're really wanting to pay all the money well, for. Well, it's also a levy, so you can't have habitat there. It, yeah, there's going to be a vegetation free zone. So this is a little bit Now, what's the ecological impact? That's really what I care about. Right? I know I'm talking about process and law, this and all that. At the end of the day, really, all I ever want to be able to do is go watch birds. <laughs> so I, I'm only doing this because there's it seems to be the only way to get to that point. Uh, so the, uh, because the science, this, oh, by the way, this is the feasibility study. It was in 2008. It's in the draft AR. I think it's somewhere in appendix B. Because the size of the site is limited, it may not be possible to incorporate large enough patches of all historic habitat types to ensure viability. Habitats are fragmented by the existing roads, infrastructure, and site development. Site may, type there, may be too small and isolated to support some species. Okay, so we maybe can't go back in time and get more land. We tried to get more land, right? Got some, we got more than people thought, less than we would have liked a lot more, less than we would have liked, we would have liked a lot more. But Still we can't get 2.3 acres away now for, for private parking, right? I mean, this this is the science of saying, hey, we went, and there's something about uh, California net catch that says, ah, there's maybe not enough land, not enough habitat. This is an important species, so let's get what we can out of this. We don't have the luxury of just giving it away. And this is the dollar. They don't have funding for this game. But the most expensive alternative, alternative one, is actually the cheapest per acre of these three that they have up here. $182 million, and that's $908,000 per acre. And all they have to do to get, so every eight, so, so three acres is like $3 million value, according to this. And they get an additional $3 million of value if they just move that levy. Now, it cost a little bit to build the extra, you know, 40 feet of levy. But then they just move the other levy all the way to the edge and look at all that additional habitat. We have seen that, yes, they have offset it for the parking lot. Um, okay, so just very quickly, there's a coalition of groups that came up with restoration principles. I know some people in this room didn't like restoration principles. I, I actually thought they were pretty good. I, you know, as I read them, I didn't disagree with any of the restoration principles. Sense. But we do want to see those restoration principles apply, uh, or they don't really do much good. So I just want to go through four here real quick. Restoration projects should bring back the natural processes and functions of healthy buildings. Because you brought these up to natural processes is not parking lots. 
Do you need to have a park lot so people can come and hike? Yeah, we kind of get that there's got to be some access, right? I ride my bike down and I wanted to down. There's got to be some access. We get that. But they have to, you know, they have to justify parking. Number two, the restoration project of clear environmental goals will be based on critical scientific evaluation of all these alternatives. So in the case of a parking garage or a lot, that would be a parking study. And it's pretty basic. You, you know, we're never going to be able to guess exactly like how many people are going to come to this new lot who's going to be the But there's ways to get at it. People do, right? They say, here's how many trips we think, we're going to think about this many visitors, the turnover, you know, people come for an average two hours, you look at other ecological reserves. We actually did. So we had some Melissa and another of our staff, part-time staff, Emily up in Tuesday birthday now. Um, I uh, worked still just part time. And they went, went through like, what, 110 garage reserves, zero parking garages, and no parking, even to the amount that we have already. Uh, okay, uh, compatible uses. I'm not going to read the whole thing, right? Parking lots not compatible use. So we would like, again, for the coalition groups, and we hope they will, we hope it happens quickly, that they'll come out and say, yeah, this, this is not a compatible use. And then stakeholder inclusion. You can't bypass the public by saying, don't tell the ecological, you know, the environmental groups, because they're going to get upset. Which, yes, you're right, people are going to get upset with the and they make this person. Don't tell them, let them do their comments, and not say, okay, Beats and Harvest, you guys want to do this. It just, it's, it's just actually not the people to do that. Like I said, nobody knows to do to bring it up. Okay, now, again, this is, I talked earlier about people of impacts. This is Fisherman's Village, and it got the address 132 room hotel, six. 5,700 square feet restaurant space, a new 30 slip marina. That's going to go where the Fisherman's Village is now if it gets approved. Right? It's still pretty far out itself. But that's again, this this parking is for that project. Yeah. So it's a mismatch. Mm -hmm. They really have this parking in the wrong draft DIR, and I don't think they're going to be able to do it. And I think that's one of the reasons. Okay, and then I have to get this in there. Deja vu. Somebody told me once. This was just a little recently, so it was years after the Annenberg finally pulled out. And I still said something about Annenberg. And one looked at me and said, you know, you like to bury the hatchet. You like to leave the hand up, you know, a buck around. And I, she was making a good point, right? She says, we're still a bit bitter about this because you never know what the Annenberg thing was. Like, <laughs> uh, that's when I quit my job, right? Because I couldn't keep up with the big PR team that was trying to sell this as an urban ecology center. Well, they built it. It's actually not pet space. It's that it was always meant to be. I love pets. I've done my own pet rescues. They tried to build this the ecological reserve. And again, they weren't straightforward about it. Um, and so, I, and, you know, not to get into that, but it's hard when they keep doing this. It, it's hard to then say, okay, but I'm going to trust you on this. It'd be a lot easier if they had done these things. You'd probably all feel a lot more comfortable uh, you know, taking one of other things. And so, uh, actually, I think that is the end. So I want to just quickly questions, but then definitely discussion, and I know people are going to want to start heading out. Let's just start with any questions, especially if there was something you were hoping to get out of the meeting that didn't get covered. Please speak up, because I'd love to get started. Do you have any description of the alternative schemes? Yeah, I did. Yes, I did take slides of it. There are some good pictures of that. I can very quickly tell you what, what they are, but try to be as objective as possible. Alternative one is very ambitious. It knocks down the levees. Are you familiar with the creek now? So it knocks down those levees. It grades both north and south a little bit. It puts new levees up around the perimeter. It takes most of the dirt to build those new levees, and then also dumps a ton of dirt on area C, where the baseball fields are. It takes Fiji, I know some people like to call it Fiji Creek, Marcia. I also say Fiji Dish, because I don't Yellow crust. <laughs> Uh, I call it a nursery. It but, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it turns it down. It's a feature I kind of like a little bit. I don't wish that the hills were there because I don't think they're ever in historically these pretty sizable mounds of dirt down there. You see, I don't think that's historical habitat. And by the way, for me, his, history only matters in terms of what's possible today. I, I'm not I'm like a big traditionalist, like, oh, we've got to get this thing back. Um, there's two, it's just a little bit less ambitious. And so when you hear it being described, a lot of you hear them say similar to alternative one. I think that, again, that's kind of what's going to hurt them, because they're all kind of three flavors of the same thing. I'm using the analogy spicy, and very I think I've ever seen there before. So that doesn't do as much of the creek. It's, it, it stops a little bit further east. And so it doesn't make any changes down here in area B, but it's the same changes on the east part of area B and area A. 
And then alternative three doesn't do anything to area B. It just knocks two holes in the levee. It creates an oxbow, a little bit of an oxbow lake, and still though needs the perimeter levees. I would be more attracted to option three if it didn't then still need the perimeter levees. Is that something else? And it digs out area A. What's that? And it digs out area A. It digs out area A, yes. Cindy? And how high, I think it's important to talk about how high are these perimeter levees? Walls. Yes. Walls. You see levee and you see like there it. is or so no, they're engineered. I know. A very, yeah, a very good question. What I will say is in the draft DIR, I've seen that in area A, they're claiming that they're from 5 to 15 feet above grade, existing grade. Yeah. So I need to go back and look. Now I'm 5, 6. Some of them are 20 feet high. Yeah. Some of the, according to the map, 20, 20 feet long. Two area stories. A, in area A, I think it's 5 to 15 feet. Um, now in the aesthetics section of the draft, I also think they didn't do a very good job of this. Because they actually don't mention, they actually say that the parking garage would not cause any aesthetic impact. <laughs> but they had a lot of pictures that were taken, I won't get into all the issues, but there was a, a firm that Annenberg hired to design their center and create the watercolors for the center. And as part of that, they designed the watercolors for the whole thing. And now they're using those still in the ground. There's a lot of stuff that's left over from the old days, it's just not true anymore, that they'll probably have to clean up. The timeline starts, they're going to start doing this in 2017, in January 2017. So obviously that never got updated. So again, I'm not trying to be, I know they had a lot of work, but they were clearly they had so much work that they couldn't go back in and sort of update this thing when they, when they released it. Uh, where was I going with that? Oh, so the pictures don't really show. It, as far as I can tell, they don't show the burns. And that, that iconic picture that I showed you, that I told you everyone takes it, of the burn with the little, you know, trellis in there, um, all that picture shows before and after is that they're going to remove those piles. And I actually don't know if they can remove the piles from an ecological perspective. You see sometimes the birds will perch there. Um, but the bigger question is, it looks like the berm, that one of the levees, goes right over that. And so they don't show that again. They don't show a big burn coming through. So I don't think with the aesthetics, with the before and after pictures, they did say that. I don't think they did a good enough job of showing people what it's going to be like. Now, if you drive down Culver Boulevard, um, sorry, I digress a lot. In 1978, and this is a big question, in 1978, Ruth Lansford, who was still with the Friends of Bible, uh, uh, there's an LA Times article where she was driving through and she got these just fields on the other side and she got out of her car and walked out of the fields and that's how she got out, right? She said, we got to save this. And I know there's some di differences of opinion in the room, about how that then played out with friends and something like that. So every time I see Ruth, I say, thank you for that. When I was 12 years old, that you stepped out of that car and got this ball. I don't always agree with what they did afterwards, but thank you that you did that. Because if they hadn't done that, that thing, that all could have been developed. There was a very different time back then. They would have developed the whole thing. They haven't So where I'm going with that is uh, a lot of people that come to cities, um, open uh, wetlands, say, oh, I'm driven through this place. And I said, I've just got to see what this is all about. So we do have a little bit of concern about the burn being so big that people are driving through, and all they're seeing is, like, uh, I don't know, is there a reservoir over there? Or is, who knows? Exactly. So that's a concern we have. Again, it's just a con that we're waiting as the pros. Um, uh, Rex, you have to Well, the, the, the burn issue is kind of interesting uh, the, because of all the dirt that's being dug out of the parcel A and in some cases parcel B, depending on which alternative. Uh, the, the vast bulk of about 1.3 million, I think, is the 1.3 million cubic yards is the largest amount that would be excavated. I think, in alternative one. Uh, I think about a million cubic yards is slated for the east of Lincoln, the parcel C. And that raises parcel C from anywhere from about 10 to 12 feet elevation on one side of the clover, and I think 15 on the lily field to 43 feet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was very interesting because the, the Annenberg uh, project uh, you know, is going to be located on this area that basically has no view of anything except the left itself. But if you look at 43 feet uh, above sea level, you have a view of the ocean. So it's kind of convenient. It's a convenient design. Maybe it's they're still they're still thinking that that's they still want to build like a high tech nature center. They still might want to do an Amazon proposal with the Amazon or with some other 
bidder that wants to pay, because if, if they, the Amber proposal is going to get $50 million to the state to pay for restoration mm -hmm. that the state didn't have. So now, that, that money was only for the, for the center. They were going to get other money for signage, but the $50 million is to build the center. Now, I just want to just quickly say. They include benefits to the state. Yeah, there were going to be benefits to the state. Yeah. Let me just quickly address your point, which is that I really do think it's a money thing, because uh, there was another incident that a lot of people know of where Playa Vista Development had a bunch of construction building from one of the projects that they built on sensitive wildlife habitat. Very bothersome. And they did because it's really costly to truck that stuff. I think if they could truck it for free, they would do it. I don't think they're putting it there. This is my thing. I don't think they're putting it there to be able to build something else and have a really good view. I think they have no other place to put it, but I don't think that that's enhancing that. They say enhanced up on habitat. I don't think they would do that. Um, again, I think it's important. Um, there are things coming up. For instance, at this point, fishing game. I don't know how. Many of you know that uh, Grassroots sued Fishing Game and Applied Capital for the illegal drains that are out there that the Coastal yes. Commission did the investigation on. So what we, because the DEIR is lacking any actual hydrology studies to show the fresh waters there, um, we are asking for that as part of when we go to the Coastal Commission because we prevailed in the, the settlement agreement that Fish and Game is asking for a coastal development permit to stop that drainage. However, it's important to know that in the DEIR, they never discussed that drainage that's been going on since 2004, which is considerable. And it is important to know that hopefully, if they, they were supposed to come in August, and hopefully it will be in December before the Coastal Commission where the public can make comment as to what is still needed to be studied on Biona and we are asking for a, hy a real hydrology study to take place. Um, the, uh, the area we also have before the Coastal Commission and before Cal EPA, we have two investigations that are ongoing before Cal EPA who has taken the information we've sent them and created these Account, so to speak, about the diversion of groundwater that Playa Vista has been doing that is contrary to their own EIR agreements, investing track agreements, where any water they bring to the surface they're supposed to cleanse and reuse on site so that they recharge the underlying aquifers. They haven't been doing that. So we are asking EPA to step in and in our discussions with the Coastal Commission, um, they, it's illegal to do that, to, to divert all of that water and to harm the wetlands. So with the Coastal Commission, we also have another complaint that they are engaged in to determine what are the volumes of water that are being diverted away, um, which the Coastal Commission has already determined that even the drains that are out there are already harming the wetlands. So to then cause Playa Capital to have to get a CDP, Coastal Development Permit, for diversion of groundwater, which they would not be able to get. But these are all things that are coming up that we're trying to deal with to bring back water to Biona that is historically goes to Biona because its waters are at or near the surface. And we all know the Playa Vista site and Grassroots has been involved with all the gas issues, which are another huge issue out there, but that they have to get rid of their groundwater because of for these gas mitigation systems to even try to work and we know that they're also failing in ways there, according to the city's audit on that. But the thing is, is I personally don't care about Playa Vista's problems with waters, but what I do want them to do is to provide the groundwater for Biona that is historically Biona's waters. So if you go to the Coastal Commission when this comes up, it, you know, your comments regarding that are important, and also for this DEIR as to why don't you have a hydrology study in here? Why is there not a seasonal wetland um, freshwater alternative? Because that's what we know Biona is historically. And they took the bond money, um, and uh, Travis Longmore, Eric Stein, and others wrote up a historical report that shows that's what its history is. And we already have more salt water than ever before with the marina, with uh, Biona Lagoon and Biona Lagoon Marine Preserve, which I'm part of that to save that, and we have a nursery there, which is great. 
by the channel itself, there is a lot of salt water there already. And what we are trying to return and protect are those precious fresh waters because Biona is unique. So this is definitely the kind of discussion that we do need to have. And I'll get to those that Patrick came in. I want to have Patrick. Patrick's from UK. And you can have your class. And I just want to, you, you've talked to me about restoration that happened in the UK. Yeah. And again, I don't think it's apples to apples in any way, but I do want to get the perspective because I think it's important to understand what people see as the plus, right, of, of this. Then put that in the context of Patricia or things that Well, doing. that's also what the bonds discuss, too. That's what the people voted for. Well, let's just. Yeah, so uh, with the risk of being controversial. So uh, I'm a member of the Royal Self Protection Birds of the UK. Uh, it's Britain's biggest landowner. A landowner, I think, has over a million in the UK. That land is huge political force. What they've been doing uh, is they are um, buying up land uh, and recreating habitats. And a lot of the, the you know, the, probably the best bird reserve in the UK, Minsmere, was reclaimed in the 60s. And this, I think this, is, this is just the context of the restoration part of it. Um, when they did it, they just used heavy equipment all those things. But they did it, you know, in a sensitive way. And, and this has been an issue that keeps coming up. Uh, I told you it's going to be controversial, but um, I, I keep, I, I get the magazine and I can when we've had our board meetings, I've shown all the pictures of when they're taking on board another uh, marsh, be it fresh water or salt water. And uh, because there's now a whole impetus to bring back marshland uh, as a, uh, to, to, to help with the, the flooding that's happening, not just here, but in, in, in the UK in particular. So there's a whole um, thing with that now. And they do use mechanical equipment, but, but it's uh, the, the equipment they have now, as opposed to what they had in the 1960s, is very low impact. It's all spread out on wide uh, loads, um, wide tracks. So the actual PSI is less than a, foot, a human boot. And you, so my point, I think mean, what I want me just to sort of open out to the floor is, is that Yes, you know, industrial reclamation isn't the ideal thing at all, but uh, not just dismiss uh, mechanical um, uh, digging out of hand, because uh, I've seen that. I grew up on, on these bird reserves, walking along. We call the levees, we call them dikes, because it's from the Dutch, and um, they are an absolutely fantastic walkway to, to circumnavigate. They're fantastic bird watching points. Because you're always you're, you're able to look down and you get a much better view of all the animals and birds there. And it is, I, you know, if I could show examples of it, I would have probably done that. But um, there's, there's so much wetlands restoration going on in the UK right now, which is very gratifying. Uh, but there is no hesitation to use heavy equipment. So that is my question: Is, is, is are there success stories in California? of wonderful restoration projects of wetlands. I think it's something right. that is a model for us. It's been done before, I'm sure. I kind of like the restoration that they did in um, Carpenteria, Sandy Land, the Nash Street. You guys know what I'm talking about? No, I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, it's lovely because they got perimeter pass and some mm -hmm. jut outs yeah. and not much incursion into the actual site. Right. There is a meandering stream area, but I know that it still gets a lot of fresh water flow, flow close to, you know, the mountains butt up against mm -hmm. the, the range there. I, that, that's an easy drive, that's a, that could be done as a day trip. And it's a field trip potentially? I love a field trips for grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the land trip would be happy to rent a bus. Yeah, um, well, well that's that's maybe over Christmas holidays. Or yeah. All right. Where is it? It's in Carpentria, so what is it called? Oh, it's, um, what is it? Truck Park Salt Park, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's at the corner of Sandy Lane and Salt yeah. Streets, and they do tours every public Saturdays, 10 a.m., I believe it is. is, is it? Yeah, but anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a nice site. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, so, um, I got interested in wetlands at Wilson Chicha. That's where I learned about loving wetlands. And I used to think up until sometime during the last 10 years 
that we were supposed to have full tidal wetlands with you know, twice a day the tides coming in and out. And I learned that because there was a misconception of everywhere in wetland protection that that's what we were supposed to have in California. And we, we did historically have that in San Francisco, San Francisco Bay, you had those two big geological features on either side. And of course, the salt water comes in and out twice a day. Same with San Diego. Right. But there's new science that this EIR is completely ignoring. And that new science partly was put out by Dr. Travis Longford, Dr. Stein, Dr. Um, Jacobs. And it was paid for, actually, by the Coastal Conservancy. We gave them the funding to do this historical research. And it woke a lot of us up, because it was something new we didn't understand before, that historically, most of our coastal wetlands did not have the tidal influence twice a day. And in fact, it was only during the winter times when the heavy storms would blow up the sand berms, and then, it, then the water would come in, which is why you have some salty soils and, and salty plants, but they weren't so salty that they were like the bay. And therefore, for thousands of years now, the species that are at Biona are, have evolved to be reliant on a more brackish and freshwater system. So they're not like some of the places you may be thinking about, Patrick, in, in the UK, and they're definitely not like the ones on the East Coast, which are you know, like Maryland and Chesapeake Bay and all of those. It's just very different. And so the final thing I wanted to say related to all the birds and all people were talking about, I don't know if you've seen this in the EIR yet, because I'm certainly not that through the whole thing. But one thing to look out for is we were given some documents from some whistleblowers at LA County Flood Control, and I know Patricia had a lot of those as well. And those documents show these were the county flood control engineers giving documents to the Army Corps of Engineers for that 408 permit they don't have yet. And they were really specific engineering drawings. And they showed the phrase that I know from development fighting all these years, rub and clear. Rub and clear. Everywhere on the whole site. They plan on rubbing and clearing, and that means taking bulldozers way more than just a boot, believe me. It means taking lots and lots of soil out, and therefore, that's where many, many, many of the animals that Jonathan documents regularly live. Right. So many of the small mammals, the, the herpetology, the you know, frogs and lizards and snakes, and all the many, many Insects, yeah. that's where they live, and you take that out, they will not come back. So let me Birds just, may come back, but not all of them. Dang it. What I like about hearing Patrick talk about these illustrations is it pulls me back out of what tool are we using and gets us back on what we saw. I, I think that's important. So yeah, it's right now. Stories. We, you know, to me, uh, what I worry about is that we'll be still talking about this in another 10 years' time. That's and okay. And, 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 and that's going to be, but you, you know, you run the risk of people getting less and less interested in it because no. that isn't a thing. And you know, we have an opportunity to create something. I've, I've seen wetlands in many parts of the world, and I, I'm not an expert. I'm not going to say I'm not preaching, but I, I just feel like there's an opportunity there, and a plan, albeit imperfect, is better than waiting for a perfect plan. No, I, I just want to bring up what Margot has said. You had talked about the Carpentria site. You're supposed to Chica also. And Travis has a uh, report out, and we have him on video in his t discussion there, talking how they did dredge out Bolsa Chica as well, and how they have to, uh, certainly how much it costs to have to dredge it out again and again. But in addition to that, Margot uh, Griswold is one of California's foremost wetland ecologists. And what they've learned also at Bolsa Chica is that it acts as a drain. So the fresh waters that are upland necessary are now being drained away through the bowl that's been created in Bolsa Chica. And at Playa Vista in particular, when I bring up the gas issues, and let's not, this is very big, and I, we obviously aren't going to go into all of that, but to dig it out, which is what I certainly believe, 
is Clyde Vista needs to drain those fresh waters out to try and get rid of them. And that is why they are pumping them and literally throwing them away into the sanitary sewer. And some of it does go into that their catch basin, their flood control system, which isn't finished yet, and it goes out into that channel. So they throw away all of those fresh waters. And they need that drain to make it act as a drain to get rid of their fresh waters. And that's not our problem. Yes, I've, I've also reviewed most of the restoration projects along the Southern California coast. And Carpinteria, for example, uh, was, was not much of a habitat you know, conversion project. There was some areas that were filled that were removed, but it's it like about 10 or 20 acres. And only about like 5 to 10 percent of the site is a scraped away soil. Uh, so the point is, is that uh, it was largely restoring it to what it was historically, and they didn't have to do a huge amount of land modification. Uh, Bolsa Chica had a lot more land modification, but at least it's close to being, in most, most cases, like it was historically, before we had to up. Except for the ocean inlet, which is, you know, the ocean keeps filling it in, and they had to dredge it every year. Uh, so it creates a lot of expenses and a lot of you know, maintenance that the, the biome project is supposed to not have that problem, which is, going to have the same problem showing. Yes. But anyway, the point is, is that uh, if, if, if you're, you know, if, if, I'm, I'm not 100% averse to bulldozing, but when you bulldoze the entire site for objectives that don't seem logical, that's where I really have a problem. Basically what's happening is, is that the north side of Bologna Creek is high up high ground, and the south of Bologna Creek is low ground, and what they want to do is switch it. Yeah. If, yeah. If, 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 if they simply restore the weapons where they are, Restore the uplands where they are, and each one of those is about you know, valuable natural habitat. You know, bring water in from the water creek in a, in a sensitive way. You'll do a lot less bulldozing, and a lot less of the problems that Marsh is, is raising. Uh, and so it's a question of historical accuracy. Uh, under the California Coastal Act, I see you're trying to no, no, worry about time. Let me, let me just jam this point. Yeah. The California Coastal Act mandates that the only thing that you can do to wetlands that are in the coastal zone, which is what this project is, is restore it. Now, if you define the definition of restoration to be anything that you want, then that's why you have a project like what the state is proposing right, right now. It's, 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 it's basically, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, they, have, they have another phrase for it. Uh, enhancement. Enhancement is, there's even another, reallocation. No, it's <laughs> the creation. The it's, well, it's habitat conversion. Yeah. If you're doing an accurate, historically accurate restoration, this is what the US EPA says. The definition of restoration, and you look it up in a dictionary, restoration is going back to what it was before we destroyed it. You know, so if you're if you're if you completely come up with a like, let's go back, uh, the, the hydrology that they're proposing in the state's plan is approximately what it was four thousand years ago before you know after the last ice age. But then again, it's also the water supply is highly polluted water. Which has its own problems. So it's not even it's not even the same as it was four thousand years ago. So it's definitely nothing like it was two hundred years ago when we modified. Learn something tonight or not some information. I just want to talk very quickly. The postcards, if you're willing really to do it, that's optional. If you're willing to fill it up, great. If not, just please leave it there because I want to save the stamp of cards for somebody else. Um, I also just want to show people I have a picture of why Bioma was a freshwater wetland. This is a Bioma watershed. And all the water would come down and go into the creek in the Really into the creek and into the wetland. So here's right here, proof of it right now. So thank you everyone for coming. We have, we have a lot of work to do, but it doesn't have to be in the front, in the front